1976, Spain. Many prisoners had just arrived at their new prison. One of them was a young man named Manuel. On his first day, he has many prisoners around him, including a 16-year-old boy named Ruby. The director treats him so badly and doesn't care that he is still underage. Manuel asks the director for help, but the director slaps Manuel in the face. All prisoners were ordered to undress before being taken to their cells. We will carefully examine you from head to toe. A jailer named Domingo offers Manuel 250 pesetas for clothing, but he declines because his suit is very expensive. Then another director named Ramon advises Manuel that he should sell his clothes to Domingo or else someone will take them from him. When mattresses are distributed, everyone receives one, but Manuel does not. He has to pay his 250 his pesetas but he has no money and doesn't want to sell his clothes either. I ended up sleeping without a mattress. Also, the bucket of water can only be drawn once a day, and the worst thing is that the water is not for bathing, but drinking water to quench thirst for three days. Because he hadn't bathed properly, his body odor attracted swarms of lice that bit him all over his body. Manuel, who has become pale from lack of sleep, complains to the director that he cannot take a shower, but his efforts are fruitless. While arguing with the director, a man named Blackie, who was in charge of the kitchen, came to hand out food. After all, Manuel and Blackie were once neighbors. Blackie warmly welcomes Manuel on his arrival and presents him with cigarettes as a sign of friendship. As the days passed, Manuel still didn't know when he would be released, whether it was two years or decades later. Frustrated and unable to endure imprisonment, Manuel knocks on his cell door and protests again, but Marino, the warden, arrives. Because of his actions, he was beaten by the guards. Three weeks passed and Manuel was transferred to the actual prison wing. Of all the prisoners only Blackie received him warmly. Manuel is then placed in the same cell as Blackie. In the same cell as Blackie is the most feared elderly prisoner, Pino. Pino owns a collection of books and novels, which he lends out to other prisoners. Otherwise, I have a lot of nice clothes hanging next to my bed. Blakey called him a dandy. As the owner of the room, Pino made it clear that Manuel was not allowed to break the rules or he would have to be dealt with. After a while, it was time for the visit. Blackie is seen chatting with his wife and children. But not Manuel, but his girlfriend, who considers Manuel the most sinful man in the world, so while waiting in front of the prison, his girlfriend's sister, Lucia, came to see him. Ricefield. A new inmate, Manuel, is bullied by a prison thug named Marbella. As Ramon told him, he forcibly took all his clothes. Shirtless Manuel reported what had happened to him. To make matters worse, Ramon demands that you pay 300 pesetas if you want to speak out as the price of democracy. If he has no money, there is no democracy for him. Prison is like that, it's all about money. Luckily, a man named Andres helps him, offering Manuel free clothing and taking him to an ex-criminal who happens to be a doctor named Boney. Boney is also in a cell with his men Augustin and Martin. As a doctor, Boney treats Manuel and advises him about injustices in prison. All the guards are true criminals, there is no such thing as justice, and true justice is money. So Boney suggests that Manuel join the prisoners' rights society, which fights for the right to pardon for freedom when the country's leadership changes. However, Manuel declined the offer, fearing trouble again. Afterwards, Blackie and Manuel head to the workshop where the prisoners work. On the way, Blackie gives him information about Marbella, the man who stole the suit earlier. Marbella is the leader of all the prisoners in Block 6 special cells. Augustine, the workshop manager, greets them and organizes work for Manuel as ordered by Boney. Out of curiosity, Manuel Blackie asks about Pino. Blackie explains that Pino was sentenced to life in prison for robbery and murdering a policeman, so no one, not even the infamous Warden Domingo, would bother him. Another meeting date came, but only Lucia came to visit. With the help of a priest, Lucia testified that she was Manuel's girlfriend. This brief meeting reveals why Manuel is in prison. He is accused of stealing company funds with his boss's son, but his boss blames him. The next day, Manuel is startled by prisoners' cries for pardon. This pardon or immunity from sentence was requested because of the corruption of the prison system that lasted for 68 years. 
however, the prisoner's demonstration becomes the subject of a joke between Blackie and Pino. They think the amnesty request is just a dream, and prison guards still take control, even though many support them. Manuel is summoned again by Boney for further questioning, but in reality Boney demands that he write the word pardon on a pile of paper with his left hand so that the guards do not see what has been written. Over the course of many days, Manuel had already written many of these. During his imprisonment, Blackie constantly spoke of his longing for children and wife, yet he was serving a very long sentence of 20 years. When morning came, something shocking happened. Blackie is knocked down by the guards along with two other prisoners, Emilio and Blaines. A prison guard found an artificial hole in the kitchen, and Blackie was suspected of participating in an escape plan. Time flew by, and at noon a security guard approached Pino with the sad news. Blackie was pronounced dead of a heart attack during an interrogation. That explanation clearly didn't make sense, and Pino didn't believe it, thinking something was wrong. Given the tight security in the prison, Blackie must have been killed to cover something up. Manuel tries to convince Pino to investigate Blackie's death, but Pino refuses, saying there is no justice in prison and fighting for Blackie will only hurt himself. Suddenly, the prisoners gather in the middle of the hall, shouting that Blackie has been beaten to death during interrogation. Security guards swarm the crime scene and beat them mercilessly. In the confusion, Manuel throws away the written pardon certificate. After his act, Manuel was dragged out and beaten before being taken to an isolation room. In fact, the existence of banknotes paid off in the end. A lawyer named Arnold volunteered to defend Manuel. He released him from his cell, demanded a speedy trial, and called for the dropping of all charges against him. At the workshop, Augustin briefs everyone on the prisoners' rights society's struggle for amnesty. Politicians are fighting to establish democracy outside, but they must also fight for amnesty inside prisons and try to get politicians to visit prisons and support their cause. You have to use media for this. Over time, Manuel's condition improved, and Lucia regularly sent him letters of encouragement. Some strange things happened in prison. Each night, the guards would drag several prisoners out of their cells for no reason, one of whom was Augustine. The prisoners immediately protested. The prisoners, led by Boney, cut off the protester's arm, ignoring the dripping blood. The word amnesty is chanted vigorously over and over again. Domingo then reveals that Augustine has been transferred to another prison and is unlikely to return. Boney then uses the opportunity to get Domingo to reject the media. Warden Marino reluctantly complied with Boney's demand that the prisoners stop protesting. After the protests ended, doctors began treating all prisoners. The Prisoners' Rights Society became popular and continued to be covered by radio and television media. Politicians and democracy activists have also launched campaigns for justice. On the day of her next visit, Lucia brought a newspaper reporting on the Battle of Manuel. Outside the prison, his supporters have started forming prisoners' defense teams. Demonstrations also began in front of the prison, with demonstrators releasing chickens with cloths labeled pardon inside the walls of the prison. The guards chased him, and the spectacle was great fun for the prisoners, including Pino. Indifferent to the prisoners' struggles since that day, Pino asked Manuel to enroll him as a member of the Prisoners' Rights Association, PRA. As a rookie fighter, Pino's first task is to kick accuser Campos and his partner off the block and kick them out. They were the eyes and ears of the guards. The first democratic elections began in June 1977. Pino, Boney, and Manuel go to Block SIXS cell to meet Marbella. After all, we have Ruby, the boy Manuel helped at the beginning of the film. Pino arrives and invites Marbella to join the PRA and plan a full-scale riot by burning down the prison. They do this to attract media. However, Marbella rejects him, believing that it will harm him and ruin all the luxuries he has had in prison so far. But Pino runs out of ideas and puts the ring on the table. Marbella knew it well, it belonged to his son. Pino tells him that his son was stabbed to death by two prisoners on orders from Warden Domingo. Upon hearing this news, Marbella was furious and gave up on the luxuries of prison. His current goal is revenge for his son. Upon returning from Block 6, Pino and Manuel's room was deliberately searched by security guards. All the neatly arranged books were taken into the prison yard and set on fire as a warning of Pino's actions. In the morning, 
After the food was served, one of the prisoners was diagnosed with epilepsy and had seizures all over his body. But in the end it was just acting. The incident was part of a plot by prisoners to take the warden hostage. That grand plan will soon be put into action. The prisoners, led by Pino and Boni, joined forces to destroy the prison and set it on fire. They took over the prison rooftop and tried to survive a rubber bullet attack by prison staff. Their battle was ultimately successful, and the entire town began to rise and show its support. After the insanity, Arnold returns to prison and asks some prisoners to participate in negotiations. Boney and Manuel volunteer to participate in the negotiations. Arnold demands that the police be kept away from the prisoners and that a judge be called to mediate. After the agreement, the prisoners surrendered and laid down all their weapons. However, one of the prisoners recognizes the judge as a witness. Apparently he's an undercover detective in a prison. After some time, the guards arrived and beat all the prisoners mercilessly. The warden lied and tricked all the prisoners into surrendering. Later that night, Manuel and Boney are summoned before prison warden Marino, who is also taken away without explanation. Manuel requests a transfer to prison and is forced to sign papers declaring that he will be released immediately after serving two years in prison. If he refuses to sign, his outrage report could lead to prosecution and an additional 10 years in prison. If he commits further offenses, each offense will add an additional 10 years to his sentence. No one knows what Manuel was thinking, but he turned down Marino's offer. The next day, the guards receive bonuses from his cell. In the end, Boney accepted the terms of a commuted transfer. All the prisoners, unaware of this, encouraged Boney, but Manuel, who knew that Boney had abandoned the fight against them, did not. Boney took away his freedom. That day, Lucia goes to Manuel again and confesses his feelings for her. Her sister has abandoned him and she is taking her place. She told him she would never betray him. Later that night, without anyone's knowledge, Manuel and Pino are kidnapped by security guards. With their heads covered, they are driven to El Espinar prison, a criminal prison on the Spanish border. They both received injections of a special drug that hardened their muscles, causing them to feel excruciating pain when they stepped on the ground and develop infectious sores. Beaten until unconscious before being placed in a cell. Then the prison rules are explained. The guards had to stand with their arms outstretched each time they searched the cell. If they refused to comply, the guards beat them again until they passed out. No protests or complaints. Otherwise they will pay the price. Driven by frustration and deep emotional stress, Pino and Manuel take extreme measures. They swallow bed bolts to refer to doctors for examination. Pino said security forces forced her to swallow the bolt, and doctors eventually agreed to write a letter asking them to return to their facility. According to the story, Pino and Manuel eventually returned and were welcomed like heroes. The PRA fighters then reconvened to negotiate their next plan. Arnold and his associates will once again submit a petition for amnesty to the new democratic government. One by one, the other prisoners begin to do the same, and a prison is burned down week after week, and so on. Finally one day, a new democratic politician named Valdez comes to visit and expresses his desire to speak to PRA executives. Manuel is then appointed as the POW's representative to negotiate negotiations. After reading all the complaints and reports, Mr. Valdez agrees with all. He stresses that all prison guards should act fairly. Manuel later clarified that while the directors claimed to be fair in front of the public, they were in fact in control of the rules. As Valdez pointed out, the tyranny of the guards has finally come to an end. Pino and Manuel are transferred to a special cell in Block 6, where Marbella welcomes them and treats them as special guests. Democrat senators join the call for pardons one after another, and prisoners also support pardons. Freedom is on the horizon, and in the midst of the excitement, Manuel spots Ruby talking to Domingo. It sounds like you're talking about something. Later that night, Manuel drives to Marbella to tell him about Ruby. But before he could utter a word, another prisoner, who happened to be the applicant Campos, knocked on the door. After that, Campos plans to give Marbella a handicraft he made. Marbella is pleased with this gift and he wants to give him two bottles of beer soon. Ruby bursts in and stabs Marbella. As it turned out, 
Campos and Ruby were allowed to conspire on Domingo's orders to murder Marbella in return for taking all of Marbella's possessions. Ruby finds Manuel and remembers his kindness. He then released Manuel and handed him two packs of cigarettes he had bought as if nothing had happened. One day, the announcement of the decision that the amnesty was denied hit everyone. As Valdez said, they could only amend the law so that prisoners had the right to a trial, but as far as amnesty was concerned, they could not. Disappointed, Manuel vents his anger by punching the jailer who made fun of the pardon struggle. Instead he is beaten to death. After his quarantine sentence is over, Pino invites him to carry out a plan he just had in mind. After all, there is a long disused elevator on one side of the prison. The elevator overlooks the prison yard. However, this is not an escape route and within three weeks the ground must be excavated and a tunnel to the sewers must be dug, or the escape team will renovate the prison. Excavation must be completed before they come. Manuel starts figuring out how to dig a tunnel without being spotted by the guards. Eventually he came up with the idea of bringing in a few people he trusted and having some of them play football all the time to drown out the sound of drilling at the beginning of a hole. As the days went by, the excavation process went smoothly and no one noticed their work. However, suddenly on the way to work they are spotted by Ruby and Campos, necessitating the two to join them in an escape plan. Two weeks later, Arnold returns and tells them of the new government's agreement to investigate any crimes committed by the prisoners. However, Manuel is no longer interested in applying for pardon. He just wants to know when the process will begin. During his three years in prison, Manuel waited, fought, resisted, was beaten and was tortured to the point of death. However, nothing changed and the process did not take place as if it was deliberately delayed. He feels the battle is back to square one and he is being held in prison without legal certainty as to when he will be released. After three weeks of clandestine excavation, they finally found an opening to the sewers the actual exit. Preparations began immediately. Pino gives Manuel the best set of clothes to wear when he goes out. Through his connections, Pino also creates a new identity for Manuel. Old Manuel was dead when he came out, and only Daniel was left. Only one security guard was on duty that day to greet the new government officials. Ruby springs into action, threatening the guards and dragging them into the tunnel. Pino and Manuel take another road, the one near the bus stop. Before exiting the tunnels, they put on extravagant costumes so that no one outside would recognize them as escaped prisoners. However, not everyone was as lucky as before, some were taken prisoner, others managed to escape. Manuel and Pino managed to catch a bus to a faraway place. After a five-hour drive, the two friends finally shook hands and said goodbye. Unexpectedly, Pino has a wad of cash in Manuel's shirt pocket, which excites him. With that money, he could take Lucia and start a new life in a faraway place where no one would recognize him. Conclusion, in the tumultuous journey of survival and resistance, Manuel endured the brutalities of an unjust prison system, forming alliances, witnessing both camaraderie and betrayal. As the struggle for justice and freedom intensified, Manuel's determination remained unbroken, leading him through escapes, hardships, and unexpected twists. In the end, with newfound hope and resources, he embarked on a path toward a new life, carrying the weight of his experiences as a testament to the unyielding spirit of those who dared to challenge oppression.